भजन बिना बावरी तूने हीरा जन्म गवाया भजन बिना बावरी तूने हीरा जन्म संत शरण में कभी ना हरि गुण गाया कभी ना आया संत शरण में कभी ना हरि गुण गाया ये संसार फूल से मन का ये संसार फूल से मन का शोभा देख लुभाया हीरा जन्म गवाया भजन बिना बावरी तूने हीरा जन्म गवाया जग है माया का लोभी 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 ये जग है माया का लोभी मन का महल बनाया ये जग है माया का लोभी मन का महल बनाया कहत कबीर सुनो भई साधो कहत कबीर सुनो भई साधो हाथ कचो नहीं आया हीरा जन्म जन बिना बाबरी तूने हीरा जन्म गवाया नमस्कार On behalf of the Department of Philosophy, Pandu College, I welcome you all to the final day of our periodic le periodic lecture series. The lecture series is sponsored by the Indian Council of Philosophical Research. We are indebted to ICPR for their kind support. Today is the third and final lecture of our lecture program. We are very fortunate to have a distinguished scholar and devoted teacher of philosophy, Dr. Shivani Sharma from Punjab University. We are immensely grateful to ma'am for her kind consent to deliver the lecture. Thank you so much, ma'am, and welcome to Pandu College. The main theme of our uh, lecture is critical thinking and philosophizing. Already the first lecture delivered by Professor A. Roghuram Raju on 15 December and second lecture delivered by Professor Nobokumar Hondikoy on 28 December 2021. Today, ma'am will deliver the third lecture on the topic philosophizing the meaning of meaning, some reflections. So we are very happy to have among us many faculty members, students, research scholars and many dignitaries, our friends and well-wishers. So I, a warm welcome to all of you. I welcome to Pandu College. So now I welcome our vice principal, Dr. Shirin Pandu Baido and Sarbari Roy Baido. I request Dr. Shirin Pandu Baido to inaugurate the session and speak a few words. Shirin Baido. Uh, thank you, Maitri. A very good evening to everyone present here. On behalf of Pandu College, I warmly welcome you all to this third lecture of the periodic lecture series 
organized by the Department of Philosophy of Pandu College, sponsored by Indian Council of Philosophical Research. Today's lecture will be delivered by a very eminent scholar, Dr. Shivani Sharma of Department of Philosophy of Punjab University. Welcome you, madam. I, uh, the title of the lecture being Philosophizing the Meaning of Meaning, Some Reflections. The earlier two very successful lectures had been delivered on 15th and 28th December by very distinguished scholars. And uh, many of us had the opportunity to hear from these distinguished scholars and we had really benefited. Uh, they were Professor A. Raghuram Raju of Department of Humanities and Social Science, IIT Tirupati, and Professor Navakuma Handik, former professor and dean, School of Humanities, Social Science, Dibruga University, respectively. I offer my greetings and warmly welcome you, madam. Uh, on this occasion, I take the opportunity to congratulate the Department of Philosophy, Pandu College, especially the industrious HOD, Dr. Maitri Sharma, for her endeavor in successfully organizing this fruitful lecture series. I'm sure this lecture will be very beneficial for all. I welcome you, madam, and we are eagerly to hear from you. Thank you, Maitri. Thank you, Sinbaidu. Now we are proceeding to the cream of the session. Problems of language and meaning occupies a very important place in the field of philosophy, both in Indian and Western. Today, ma'am will deliver a lecture on the philosophy of meaning. So let us enter into the magnificent world of meaning of meaning. So before inviting ma'am to deliver her lecture, I request my colleague, Dr. Moiri Borman to give a brief introduction of Dr. Shivani Sharma to this resource person. Moiri. Good evening, ma'am. It's a great honor and privilege that Dr. Shivani Sharma is with us. Dr. Shivani Sharma is an associate professor from Department of Philosophy, Punjab University. She is also a gold medalist in Masters in Philosophy. Her area of specialization is about Indian and aesthetics. She is also an ICPR fellow in the year 1997 to 1999. She has also a long administrative experience. Her publications will really surprise us. She has a lot of publications, both in national and international research journals. I like to mention some of the topics like values and their creative expressions, Dharma and Brahmana, the foundations of Indian culture, Dharma, the microchip of morality, self as Kanda, interpreting the elements of Buddhist ethics, and many more. He has also around 68 papers in different symposium, workshops, international conference. She also published book reviews in her credit, like Classical Hindu Thought, The Philosophy of Vedanta Sutra, and many more articles were published in newspapers, and she has also been invited as resource persons in many refresher courses, orientation courses, and many more. Lastly, I want to say that she has also been as a chairperson in Department of Philosophy, Punjab University from 2015 to 2021. Thank you, ma'am. I again welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Muri. Now I invite Dr. Shivani Sharma, ma'am, to deliver her lecture. And one announcement, the program will be recorded. So I hope you have no objection. The program will be recorded. Yeah, yeah, it's OK. okay. It's OK with me, rest of, yeah. OK. okay. All right. uh, thank you. Uh, let me begin by expressing my heartfelt gratitude, deepest sense of gratitude towards uh, the Pandu College, the authorities of the college, uh, Dr. Shireen Bano, and uh, my very dear colleague and a friend, uh, Dr. Maitre Sharmaji, and her colleagues of the department uh, for inviting me, for thinking of me in this ICPR sponsored uh, periodic lectures series. Uh, I do believe that uh, 
such platforms and such occasions uh, enable the world of academia uh, to contribute back to the society uh, by and also uh, maybe through the methods of debate and discussions but also it helps us uh, to mitigate the philosophical rigors of certain theories and uh, concepts and ideas which uh, sometimes otherwise we do not get to discuss so i really truly uh, i'm thankful to the authorities and uh, dr methri sharma uh, for uh, inviting me and giving this opportunity to share my views and i also look forward for your contributions and points that i might skip and uh, i look forward uh, to be with you for the next 45 minutes um so uh, as just in order to engage further i am reminded of uh, that this particular topic that is the concept of shabd praman has been very close to my heart and i am i have been very very fascinated with this uh, concept and why do i feel so i often ask myself uh, that why i i what is the reason for this charm now, what charms me uh, with regard to this uh, shabd praman so the answer that generally because i also understand that there are limits there are uh, certain uh, limitations uh, you know the kind of knowledge that one gets through uh, pratyaksha or perception uh, it is so evident and it is so direct but the kind of knowledge that we get get from shabd or word uh, the knowledge is not as direct as pratyaksha and also when we uh, you know as a student of aesthetics when uh, we read plato he clearly mentions that the world of poetic words you know it has uh, it has great strength to deviate and change the route of young minds so i completely agree that yes there is a potential in the poetic world of words to uh, you know channelize our energies in a different way but still there is a potential of being deviated more so what is it that you know what is the charm that holds for this shabd praman so what i could gather initially uh, as a student of philosophy um, that it is primarily that the word works it functions it is the functionality that the uh, word has uh it it works for uh, many of us in in fact for almost entire humanity and in what way i am saying that in what way i wish to claim is that it is the communication the process of communication it helps in understanding it helps in interpreting it helps in uh getting to the other person and that is how i say that yes word is somehow uh, fascinating because it works it functions it entails a functionality which is very essential in the process of communication in reaching out to other people and also i wish to share uh, one of my uh, very uh, you know first hand experience when i was a research scholar uh, uh, in punjab university itself i had the opportunity to uh, read the work of uh, professor kunjini raja Uh, uh indian theory of meaning indian theories of meaning uh whereby you know a 95 page article was only on theory of you know meaning of meaning so uh, i i wish to bring it on record that the title of my presentation philosophizing the meaning of meaning has deep roots i go back i it is it should be considered as uh, you know an obeyance uh, or whatsoever uh, a respect a mark of respect uh, because uh, there was something which was still hanging on my mind the kind of work that uh, has been done by professor kunjini raja and i still consider it is an epitome uh, in the sense that it still has the potential to crack the intricacies of philosophy of language of purv mimamsa of uh, hermeneutics and there are so many other things of uh, even to some extent uh, the, gra the sanskrit grammar also 
since I was doing my, my partial uh, research work was on poor Mimansa, so I had this opportunity to undergo this uh, book, which I find and I would like to recommend for the students, those who are interested in philosophy of language in some way or the other. So uh, to, in order to begin, I wish to also quote uh, um, Professor T.R.V. Murthy, who writes that uh, in order to understand philosophy can be uh, claimed to be something uh, which is a critique of language. It is primarily a critique of language. And the problem of what we can know, what we can know is directly related to what we can say. So what, what he's trying to portray is that our language and it is it falls very close to Wittgenstein also uh, those who are into philosophy of language uh, you know whereof one cannot speak thereof one must be silent it goes similar way TRV Murthy also holds that it is primarily uh, you know uh, a critique of language and what we can know is probably related with what we can say and words and thoughts are always you know they go together uh, after all uh, what we think has to be communicated has to be expressed and it becomes an object of uh, criticism appreciation or whatever we may say but the communicated idea has the potential to be criticized to be appreciated and to be pondered over and similarly uh, this philosophy of language has uh, not only uh, it is not restricted only to communication uh, i i find it very close following it uh, um, i find it very close to the idea of gadamer when he says that uh, language has something to do with uh, it is hermeneutics he talks about hermeneutics that language the aim of hermeneutics is to understand the relationship between language and reality so it is not only that uh, philosophy of language is interested only uh, in communication. Of course, communication is one of the uh, part of it, but it is only partial. But the aim is to reach higher. And of course, uh, it will be very interesting uh, for students of uh, philosophy to understand, to realize this fact that understanding, interpretation and language, they are deeply interconnected you cannot interpret other than what you have understood so understanding and interpretation they are deeply connected and there is a deep role of there is a deep significance of language uh, you know into this entire process which probably Gadamer has to uh, has a lot of uh, work on it uh, well I'll be restricting myself to the Indian uh, dimension of it but uh, these are the similarities that I could find uh, between uh, the readings of T.R.V. Murthy and Gadamer. Uh, so coming back to the concept of reality, when uh, we have this uh, concept of reality when it comes to uh, philosophy as students of uh, metaphysics also, we are being told and guided by our teachers and uh, seniors that we must be uh, a little critical of the relationship between uh, language and reality whether there is a possibility to represent reality through a linguistic expression or not. And certainly the first go or the first answer that we get is no, 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 that is not possible. Why? Because reality is absolutely transcendental and we do find different schools on it. Uh, Buddhism would say that no, uh, reality is Chatushkoti Vinirmukt. When it comes to uh, Vedant, Vedant will uh, surely define uh, ultimate reality brahma as satyam jnanam anantam brahma it does define but they restrict vedantins would re restrict this definition only to uh vyavaharik satta but they do consider that a nirvachaniyata although a nirvachaniyata is a, a reference made to maya not to brahma but they do believe that yes it is difficult uh, to explain uh, the ultimate reality in linguistic terms not only this, uh, we have reference from Kathopanishad, whereby uh, the absolute reality is said to be asparsham, ashabdam. All the five uh, avyayam, it has no uh, limbs, it has no uh, sparsh, you can't touch it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. 
and it is beyond a shabdam the first word is a shabdam so the reality itself is a shabd your words cannot express reality your words cannot uh, apprehend reality in that sense i uh, think that uh, the indian philosophical stream of thought has been majorly uh, in this particular regard uh, endorses that reality cannot be apprehended or uh, understood in terms of language but i think uh, there are two thriving schools uh, one is purv mimansa and the other one is grammarian uh, standpoint which endorse that no reality is understandable through language also rather it is within the reach reality is within the reach of uh, language and there are different reasons uh, due to limited time i'll restrict myself to purv mimansa but here and now uh, now and then i'll be referring to uh, giving some reference of bhartri hari also uh, because i think uh, a complete understanding of meaning of meaning uh, is acquired uh, while referring to bhartri hari also uh, to the grammarian uh, standpoint also so uh, let me just quickly give one uh, view of uh, purv mimansa for them how what reality actually is so for them reality is divided into two uh, frames one is drisht drisht jagat and the adrisht jagat drisht jagat represents all that is you know sensible perceptible that and also nameable they use the term vyapadeshya whatsoever is perceivable whatsoever is nameable vyapadeshya so that is how language is related to the to the drisht jagat that is visible uh, world how about the adrishya the adrisht world that is uh, the transcendental world you'll be not surprised to uh, know this that uh, purv mimansa is one philosophy which uh, doesn't talk about uh, the concept of god per se it talks of adrishya world or adrisht world in majorly three terms one is apurv and the other is devata and the third uh, one is swarga now swarg is not to be uh, visualized in terms of you know uh, something it is whatsoever is not perceivable but yet it is not uh, imagination it is not something imagination uh, it is why do they believe why purv mimansa believes that yes these are the entities which are transcendental in nature the three that i mentioned apurv swarg and of course uh, mm, apurv swarg and that is why i keep writing my points i forget ha ah, apurv swarg and devata why why do they believe in it because they say these ideas have been informed through shabd now if you have a word it means i not i mean they are not saying that they have specially mentioned that not everything that you imagine if the vedas are giving a word it means that it is going to some it is going to have some result why they are saying so because they believe in the theory of yagya also mm -hmm. so finally they will establish that your word leads you to action through bhavana and then that action will yield some result which is apurv which is not drishti which is not here now present here in the uh, present times so it will emerge finally so it is very interesting that the concept of devata for them which is again a form of reality for them is nothing but a word for example you say indra now indra is not an entity existing out there in some form which is intoxic who gets intoxicated or rather they differentiate between two forms of devatas also that one is a uh, a form of devata to which we you know offer oblations yeah another is a recipient only of the hymns the mantras mantras that we chant now uh, this kind of uh, i would say uh, this kind of uh, understanding for an entity like you know devata and they refuse that it it is not an entity and rather they uh, uh, show that in the, the superiority of uh, mankind why because they they have this ability to perform a yagya uh, devatas cannot perform yagya it is only uh, the privilege of 
uh, human uh, being that he or she can perform the uh, yagya and apurv being the second and swar uh, this is the uh, concept uh, i wanted to bring it to your notice uh, while we understand the concept of um, reality of purv mimansa because i will be traveling uh, through the lines of purv mimansa while referring to uh, the concept of shabd and of course i'll be uh, referring to bhartrihari uh, coming to the concept of reality of bhartrihari or the grammarians uh, largely uh, we do find uh, references whereby they say that uh, word especially word has two points uh, they they say word has a sound and it has an imperishable it is an imperishable uh, aspect as well as perishable aspect <laughs> the imperishable aspect to what they call is sport now this sport is something a unified which is sequenceless which is absolutely non spatial non temporal kind of an entity but so far perishable is concerned they say that it is the sound it is the sound which uh, comes along to with the word so and of course uh, they treat this concept of shabd as tatva tatva means the final ultimate uh, reality and of course the real word uh, i would rather read it the real word that is sport is indivisible it is sequenceless because the moment you assume something to be in sequence which is coming to you in sequence it is following space and time conditions and it falls into that category whereby it will again be not transcendental but mundane and phenomenal and the ultimate reality it externalizes itself through name and form aap kuch bhi duniya mein dekhi utha kar uska ek naam hoga uska ek aakar hoga so bhartri hari agrees to this view that there is a ultimate reality which manifests through name and form and this is the world of multiplicity and but this multiplicity entails sequence but reality ultimate reality is absolutely sequenceless there is no sequence in it and this shabd tatva transcends this principle of kram and it is for this reason they assume shabd to contain sound and sport now sound is perishable but sport is not perishable and this is how uh, you know sound reveals the real world uh, bhartri hari claims that there is no cognition without the operation of words this is very significant that one cannot know without the operation of the words and all knowledge is illumined by the word and it is not that we have a thought first and then we look for words or it is not the either way uh, uh, that we have words first and then we look out for the thought it is absolutely a combinatory play it is absolutely a conjoined way that words and thought they evolve together they come up together and hence uh, uh, for uh, for grammarians uh, they are the expression of deep spiritual impulse to know and to communicate so the purpose of language uh, word is primarily knowledge and to communicate to express to come out of uh, you know Uh, they have different uh, levels of uh, existence also so and you will be very surprised to uh, uh, you know when i was preparing uh, for this presentation i got to know few other points uh, other than this uh, the word meaning uh, uh, problem the word sound problem that uh, word sound problem is not only that we hear the word there are three problems with regard to word that i hear a word but i also hear it with a sound right you are listening to me but you are listening to the word and the sound so this communication process the speaker there are two poles the one is one is speaker and the other one is listener there is a possibility that the speaker becomes the listener also am i not listening to what i'm saying i'm hearing but here it is not supposed to listen he is supposed to grasp and understand the meaning what has been told to him so the process of communication imbibes basically it has a prerequisite that the idea should be conveyed the 
the knower, uh, the speaker all, already knows what he is to speak. But the transmission of the idea is important for the hearer. So it is like a beneficiary or a beneficial movement of or transmission of the idea for the uh, listener, for the hearer. And also, uh, one more, I mean, if we transgress this um, uh, debate into, you know, um, because since I see that Alokji is there, so there is a possibility, you know, uh, that we not only listen to the what is being told, we rather listen to the assertions that are being made. So uh, words are not merely words. They, they completely carry cultural baggage. They completely carry biases. They completely have their own uh, you know, paradigm from where they are coming, what they are saying. They are assertions. They could be denials and so many things. But technically speaking, in the uh, domain of philosoph uh, philosophy of language, sound and word have been very troublesome uh, into a troublesome relation. Why? First, we hear the word comes to us through the sound. So when they are so identified that word and sound are not different, so how are we going to understand the ontological difference between them? This is one problem. Second problem is that words are manifestors. Words, when you speak a word, it manifests an object. And if it manifests an object, how do we differentiate? Suppose there is, you know, uh, some um, few people who are talking at a distance. Now they are talking and we are not able to make out what words are being spoken there. Rather, we are only able to listen to some, just I'm both sure, that we are only able to hear that, yes, some sounds are being there, but very discrete sounds. We are not able to understand. So what is happening here is that there are words, but we are not able to understand. So that means we are able to make sense that there are sounds. So how do we perceive words from sounds? Sounds we can perceive, but we cannot make sense what words are being spoken there. So it is another uh, troublesome uh, point with regard to word and uh, sound. And grammarians have taken up this issue uh, very seriously in their uh, later discourses. And uh, also, I, I think... Uh, another point which is objectionable uh, that we hear sounds sometimes we hear sounds and imperceptible words also so a deaf person who cannot hear a sound should be able to hear a word if there is a case for example sounds become imperceptible sometimes for example, we all know language, but a child who has not learned a language, he still perceives sounds. So it should happen so that if we are able to understand word, we will not hear the sound. So it is one of the issues that I wanted to bring uh, to the notice of uh, the audience so that you know uh, I can also be benefited later on. So continuing with the uh, debate of word and meaning, there are a lot many questions uh, which are fundamental to this debate. Uh, why Shabd is a Praman? The clear cut answer that we get is it surely gives us knowledge. But there are other related questions uh, when we talk of meaning of meaning. And I also wish to bring it to your notice that it is only a metaphor. When we say meaning of meaning, it is just a figurative expression because the moment we talk of meaning of meaning, it will nothing uh, be but the first meaning becomes the word. Only word has a meaning. Meaning has no meaning. It is only figurative expressions. So uh, at times, even if Plato denies, uh, you know, uh, the potential of poetic words, but finally they have to resort, uh, they fall on uh, poetic expression sometimes, uh, and like Professor Kunjini Raja also did, and I'm also trying to uh, endorse uh, this, being a student of aesthetics. Uh, so further engaging questions in this discourse would be, what is the concept of uh, word? How it is connected? What is the concept of Shakti? How the word, it is believed that Purv Mimansa school 
uh, ensures that the word and meaning are related to the concept of uh, Shakti. And uh, this concept of Shakti is very, very natural. It is pre-given. It, it has not been created by anyone. Rather, Nayayikas will say that no, this relation is conventional and it has been constructed later on. And of course, they also say that if uh, word and meaning are created, they primarily say that it is created by the will of God, uh, just as uh, you know other uh, things, the universe has been created by God. But Mimansa restricts it. Mimansa says it is very difficult for Poom Mimansa to visualize a time and a society whereby language never existed. They say, no, language has always been a part of just God, just as you know, the universe was created, so was the language. And hence the relationship between word and meaning is purely natural. Nothing has been constructed out of it. And also uh, the word, uh, but Nayaikas would say that we learn language. And how it has been learned, there are eight ways. I'll just come to this a little later. Throughout, uh, you know, from one generation to one, another generation, we learn language. And this is how, how do we do it? Through popular usage of language. That whatsoever is popular, you know, we get to, uh, we get to learn it. And uh, Nayayikas have a very strong point of contending Mimansakas and refuting Mimansakas when uh, Poor Mimansa upholds the theory that word and meaning have are joined by a natural bond. So Nayayikas say what they object is that if the, if the bond between word and meaning is natural, then the moment I speak a word, the object should be there. Suppose if I say fire, the object fire, the word fire should immediately come up with the object, the padarth, pada and padarth, the object fire, but it doesn't, uh, you know, come to us in that way. And hence, Nayaikas have an edge, somehow they have an edge over Purv Mimansa when they criticize uh, Mimansakas on this point, uh, that the, uh, the bond between word and meaning is not as natural as it seems to be. And also uh, the second point, uh, that uh, they have uh, when they criticize uh, Mimansakas uh, is that the word relation, the word and meaning relation, if it is natural, how, how, does, how is it so that a word changes its meaning contextually? So for this, Mimansakas have um, tried to answer in, uh, in an appropriate manner uh, rather. And probably this is the reason that uh, eternality of word and non-eternality of words, uh, nityata, shabdiki nityata has become a concern of for Mimansakas as well as uh, Nayayikas. They, Nayayikas would refute that word is not, uh, they would say that word is not eternal, but Mimansakas, since it is a question that are deeply connected to the existence of the and acceptance of the Vedas, although Nayayikas also believe in the uh, you know, authority of the Vedas, but they do not uh, accept that words are eternal, but Mimansakas will accept it. And uh, Nayayikas will also say when this bond between word and meaning uh, is created by God, because Nayayikas would accept the existence of God and when this uh, bond is created by God. This is uh, this would be known as abhidha, and if it is done conventionally, it will be known as uh, paribhasha. That is dictionary, dictionary kind of definitive lexical, uh, whereby you know we learn meanings. And the point, the final point uh, of Nayayikas is to establish that language is learned conventionally. This was another uh, very significant point that I considered. Uh, to be shared and discussed with you all. Another pertinent question with regard to meaning of meaning that we encounter is that what is the nature and function of language and how language is learned, problems of uh, eternality of word, whether we, uh, whether we have enough of arguments to believe that the word is eternal or not. Yes, Mimanskas have tried to answer that. Yes, why do we believe in the eternality of words? Because as and when I need to use the same word. 
I can revive the word and I can speak the word. So it is true that uh, it, the eternality for uh, eternality of words for Mimansakas uh, gets justified by this argument. And also, uh, what are what is the correlation between words in a sentence, and how do we interpret? You know, the problem of interpretation of a sentence. What are the preconditions of a sentence? Yogyata, Kamsha, Sannidhi, Asit, uh, and Tatparya. Uh, all these conditions uh, are conditions which we'll be just reflecting in a while. And uh, also uh, one major uh, philosophical debate that has troubled uh, Nayaikas and Mimansakas, and of course, uh, Buddhism has been part, uh, have, has partly addressed it, but I'm not picking up the concept of Apohavad, which is, um, you know, a little technical and uh, will be completely deviating the discussion uh, that when a word does a word refers to a class or it refers to a uh, particular this is uh, this has uh, also gripped uh, the minds of uh, indian philosophers uh, i mean for a long time and uh, we also uh, understand that there are a number of languages when we talk of meaning of meaning coming back to this uh, concept, we understand there are a number of languages and these languages, many of them are, they, they sustain themselves only at a spoken uh, level. Many of the languages are merely spoken. There are sign languages. For example, you are driving a car and you see a curve ahead and now you just make out it's a sign language that it is it is saying that the road is curving you see a t point you make sense that the road is ending here it is it is a stop now so uh, this is a sign language there are not only sign languages there are uh, you know pictograms there are uh, uh, logograms whereby egyptian language you know you have pictures and those pictures have complete meaning to them so there is no word but it's a picture not only this, we have, uh, you know, natural language. Uh, when we talk of birds chirping, we have, you know, uh, let's take an example of uh, the bird, the bees, the bees, how do, how do they, you know, make a sound, buzz, you know, and then uh, waterfalls, they have their own sounds, and then swish and swirl. These are the expressions, you don't, you do not have any word for them. So you associate the sound that is being produced by the activity or the event, you add, you can join the, uh, the sound and the uh, event. And that is uh, one of the languages that we come across. And also uh, we know that gesture language, the body language. Uh, but uh, the point that I wish to make is that the way spoken languages is spoken language is a logical priority to written languages if we want to uh, strengthen or if we want to make a record of any language spoken language is a logical necessity but in order to have a written language spoken uh, language becomes one of the priorities one of the logical priorities uh, of recording it in and it is certainly uh, one of the greatest, I would say, uh, strengthening uh, uh, methodology to, you know, that is probably why uh, Vedas were written, although the transmission of the Vedas were earlier, it is believed that it, it was never written, but later, at a much later uh, stage, uh, Vedas were written. Uh, earlier, they were only orally transmitted. So uh, there are ways and means of uh, you know communication through language and by because languages are multiple in nature and they have different uh, you know ways of expression and communication and uh, how words are to be interpreted now this is something uh, which is very very technical that we find in books uh, that there are ways to interpret there are uh, ways to understand words uh, to mean out to give meaning, how the meaning is, uh, you know, is to be understood. So, and the first uh, that how these languages are learned, as I just uh, mentioned uh, 
little uh, had some time back that how do we learn languages there are eight ways the first is vriddha vyavahara vriddha vyavahara that i learn language when i see my elders you know uh, acting according to the word that somebody asks somebody x ask is uh, asks y to get something and now the onlooker the observer is observing the agent who has gone to bring that thing or the object now here it is not see how beautifully nayayikas mimansakas and grammarians have worked, uh, you know worked on this idea of vriddha vyavahara it is not all that easy that one word it involves three processes that the the process of pratyaksh is involved the process of inference is involved and the process of arthapatti is also involved in vriddha vyavahara that i observe as a child i observe that yes something i i listen to the pratyaksh auditory pratyaksh right i get to hear that yes something has been said now i infer that this movement the agent who's who has just gone is related to this and then finally arthapatti comes in that now i understand okay this event this word this action and this word were interconnected and that is how i get to mean i get to learn the language that yes vriddha vyavahara that i see i observe i infer and i assume now this is what vriddha vyavahara actually means second uh, concept is aaptavakya that my mother my parents my my teacher my friends they tell me okay look she is my friend look um, he is my teacher look he is my student now this is from coming from an aapt purush aapt vyakti that also gives us knowledge not only this vyakaran is another form vyakaran whereby etymological roots uh, see entire indian philosophical discourse god can you just switch off your audio please so entire discourse uh, of indian philosophy is heavily based on sanskrit language it is a divine language and hence the grammar portion is the base is the root and whereby they say that uh, see the word curve i just want to bring it uh, for your notice and for your concern the word curve c u r v may not have etymologically the meaning curve this may be given but the term vakra vakrata tedha pan it contains the in in its root the meaning and that is how sanskrit language becomes very very significant the meaning is embedded in the in etymology the root the root of the and that is why you know uh, there are uh, there are opinions that the most of the nouns are from the verbal roots but it has another counter uh, limitation ki agar aapke uh, naam jo hai naam agar kriya se jude honge to utn, jitni kriyaen hongi utne hi naam ho jayenge which is logically uh, it is not acceptable so it is not necessary that all nouns are derived it is from the yask i uh, if i am not wrong yask says so that uh, not um, all the nouns have you know derivations in their verbal roots which is uh, uh, which has been of course uh, taken up for uh, uh, later discussions and so vyakaran is also one of the quickest and safest way to learn language correctly and also uh, upaman that is comparison we also learn meanings of things of words through upaman that is comparative knowledge and finally kosh dictionary we get to learn the meaning of words or uh, you know through definitions which are found in dictionaries and also one more significant that is vakya shesh that in order to understand the meaning of any word entire passage has to be taken which uh, you know in which uh, the passage uh, the word in which passage is it is appearing that passage has to also be taken into context and vivriti sometimes you know we have to fall upon uh, fall back upon uh, commentaries also that one word you know it plays havoc uh, while we interpret uh, and hence we have to take into account what the commentator uh, the vrittikara is trying to uh, narrate so that is also very significant and 
eighth condition is uh, that if we say that picker is, uh, you know, we do not get to understand what is a picker. So the sentence, find it in the sentence that picker uh, sings beautifully on a mango tree. Now, something which sings on a mango tree could be a bird, right? So uh, these are the uh, few conditions whereby, you know, we get to understand the meaning of, uh, you know, the word, uh, of course, the how how do we interpret meaning of the word? So these are the few conditions. Uh, and also, uh, very interestingly, uh, uh, there are homophones, the problem of homonyms and homophones. Now, uh, Bhartri Hari has, of course, uh, pointed it that many of times, for example, I and I, I with I and my I, these are the homophones. Uh, we, we class them as uh, homonyms, but uh, they are not homonyms, sorry. We class them as homophones. Why? Because they sound similar. I, I, hair, hair, the rabbit, you know, bal or so the problem of homophones is also a part of this uh, word meaning discourse, uh, which is uh, very significant and it has been handled uh, in both East and West uh, traditions in, in their own particular way. But Bhartri Hari uh, mentions it that probably uh, the problem of homonyms sometimes could be a problem of homophones, which, uh, uh, which is, you know, uh, which must be avoided. Uh, another um, significant, I, I'll be just closing up uh, with few other things which are very uh, important. Uh, when we try to interpret meaning of a word, we have uh, different, uh, you know, uh, parameters. We have different criteria. Uh, one of them is like, you know, one of the conditions is sansarga, that the word appears with something which it, it is known to appear with. For example, Sashankha Chakro Hari, that Hari, the Lord Lord Vishnu, is always with Sashankha Chakra, discus and you know conch. These two are permanently to be found with Lord Vishnu. So wherever, uh, otherwise the term Hari is also meant. Uh, it it is also used for monkey also. But when it comes Sashankha Chakra Hari, it is in the context of Sansarga. What is you know accompanying what are the accompanying features so that is how we interpret viprayog thereby a shankha chakro hari what kind of a hari we are talking of which does not have uh, you know uh, conch and a discus now in this context it can be interpreted as a monkey also and of course sahacharya this is a natural association when we say ram and lakshman hereby we are not referring to uh, Ram as Balaram or Parshuram, the reference with regard to Lakshman would be necessarily Ram and not uh, otherwise. Of course, another point of view whereby, you know, uh, we can understand the meaning of word is uh, Sahacharya. That is, uh, uh, sorry, it is Sahacharya, Virodhita. Virodhita is like a complete opposition. When we talk of Arjun and Krishna, so here, Arjun is known to, uh, Arjun, sorry, Arjun and uh, Karan. When we talk of uh, the two, we are not talking, we are not referring Arun to be a son of Kunti or we are not uh, referring him to be a Pandav. Rather, we are talking of Virodhita. We are, the meaning has to be taken out in this context that yes, Arjun is an enemy or Karan is an enemy of Arjun. They are op they are diametrically opposed to each other. Also, uh, it is the purpose, the purpose of the word uh, that has been conveyed. Uh, for example, uh, the example that we get is Thanum Bhaja Bhava Chidde, that is uh, Bhava Chidde, that is uh, in order to, you know, mitigate your sorrows and suffering and pain, uh, one must, you know, pray to the Lord. Now, hereby, Sthanum is also known for Shiva and it is also known for tree. Now, you have to interpret what is the purpose of Bhakti, what, what we are asking actually, we are asking for Bhakti and hence it has to be Lord Shiva and not a tree. And next is the Prakaran. 
prakaran is the context it is devo janati sarvam now here the word devo devo refers to god also but it also refers to king also so my lord knows everything it means the king here and not uh, we are not referring i mean entire all the things have to be taken into consideration but this is uh, you know prakaran the context is also very important and ling ling is also it is an indication from another place that is makara dhwaj is also known as it is another name for ocean as well as it is a name of uh, god of love so uh, according to context it has to be interpreted auchitya that is propriety and of course when it is say uh, it is said patu vo daita mukha mukham refers to here uh, as mukh but not uh, it has not to be interpreted literally rather the terms have to be sometimes interpreted in the context of propriety that may the the favor of the, the the stars of the lady of the house be favorable to uh, to you this is how it has to be interpreted desh kal these are the and of course uh, uh, swar that is accent that where are you uh, putting emphasis on for instance this is very interesting that uh, indra shatru if you are putting uh, focus if you are giving extra accent to the uh, last syllable shatru then probably you are saying killer of the indra and if you are putting accent in the first syllable then you are saying one who has killed uh, one who has uh, one whose killer is indra so this is how uh, probably i think uh, there are few other uh, important points uh, i i'm also reminded of my ma classes when uh, you know we had this uh, great opportunity to learn uh, john hospers um, i saw professor geeta manakthala here some some time around and um, i'm reminded of uh, you know when we have uh, you know uh, the meaning of meaning indicator cause effect Uh, uh, not only this significance purpose that uh, how do you interpret uh, the meaning of the word uh, the the purpose it is indicator the twister in the sky the twister in the sky means that it indicates that there is a meaning the meaning there is no word for it but it's a twister in the sky it means that tornado is approaching there is a cause the rain you see the rain and then you uh, you see the uh, you know Uh, clouds as the cause and then you interpret that the meaning is that the rain is coming and similarly the opposite the effect and of course explanation that you see you know footprints on sand and then you get to uh, say oh uh, who was it who traveled on the sand then you explain the phenomena and then the meaning is taken out and of course the purpose the purpose of hammer is to you know strike hard the purpose of knife is to cut so uh, and of course ambiguity is one of the problems that when we say uh, it is sharp the student is sharp the knife is sharp the cheese is uh, sharp they all have different connotations so ambiguities and their uh, you know type token uh, ambiguity process product um, ambiguity that we say if you are writing uh, i am a good girl i am a good boy 100 times you are actually you know tokening what is written just once so these are the problems that uh, that are you know we get to see uh, while interpreting the meaning of the word and of course there are a uh, lot many other things like uh, yogic root uh, there are uh, these are the technical aspects that uh, we have uh, etymology uh, of the word that is uh, you know yogic and rude he uh, for example the word the term gau it the etymology of gau is actually uh, nothing but anything which moves but what we have done is that we have restricted this movement only to gau we know that a bus moves but we don't call a bus or a car as gau we call gau which has implications which has etymology of movement then a yogic root then yoga root uh, whereby you know the term pankaj is interpreted only to be you know this is how convention goes on 
that we say there are a lot many things which are born out of mud, but we interpret uh, Pankaj only as a lotus. And there are a lot many other things here. So the uh, composite, the parts of the word, they must match the whole and the whole must match with the parts. And that is how the uh, meaning of words uh, are interpreted uh, while we understand either grammarians or Purnimansa or uh, Nyai philosophy also. And uh, I, I think uh, with this, and yes, um, I uh, should not fail to mention the, you know, uh, Abhidha, Lakshana and Gyanjana. These are the uh, powers of word which we get to, you know, the literal meaning, the secondary meaning. Philosophy is always based on philosophy heavily depends on, uh, you know, Lakshana. And uh, aesthetics is uh, surely it depends on Vyanjana Shakti. And of course, we also have uh, theories of meaning, uh, Prabhakar and uh, Kumaril, Abhitan Veva, whereby, you know, it is said that uh, words in a sentence, they have their independent uh, significance. And it is only later on they combine together to give a complete sentence meaning. Whereby Anvita Bhidhan uh, would say, no, uh, it is both it, uh, it, the universe, the, 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 the compiled meaning is more important. And that is how, you know, uh, but this is a theory of meaning, which is for the sentences. But uh, so far, the meaning of the words is concerned. This is probably, uh, I think I could gather uh, for this presentation. Uh, I'm thankful to the authorities once again for uh, giving me this opportunity to be here to share my views. And it was really learning um, episode of my life. Thank you so much, Maitreji. Thank you. Thank you, Shivani ji, for your wonderful deliberation. It's really wonderful. So now the session is open for discussion. May I ask a question? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Oh, thank you very much, Shivani ji, for your very, very informative uh, lecture. Uh, for especially for me, who is not in touch with the philosophy of language and especially Indian philosophy of language. So many things to learn. And for that, I thank you very much. So I cannot. Uh, uh, ask a very in-depth question, but what I gathered from your presentation is is the uh, I must must ask what is your take, your own take on this issue, because you started talking about shabd pramana, and then you discussed all the different systems of Indian um, philosophy. What is your take? Will you go with Urumi Mainsa or with the grammarians or with the Nyaya philosophy? Because there is a difference between these uh, systems. And uh, so what is your take? I think that will give a, a, a some sort of conclusive your take on, on this issue. And then a question comes to my mind that can there be a bird without meaning? Because uh, there are many uh, words which denote some sort of transcendent reality. Whether that reality is there or not, how can a word convey that? This is the question. All right. <clears throat> the first one. Oh, and, and, and another uh, related question is another related to this is not only in, in, in uh, transcendent world, but also there is a, a an example in uh, science. Uh, last uh, in last century, there was a word used ether, and it was supposed to pervade in whole of the universe. Later, it was found that nothing like that pervades the universe. So that word was dropped because it did not relate to any reality. So I think word 
and meaning is not uh, naturally related what what uh, what is your take on that that has to be uh, discussed i think uh, right. and, and and one more thing uh, it's a sad question i'll i'll forget no, 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 all no i'm not asking any any serious question it is very simple no, no, it is not about serious i'll forget the questions ha huh? okay batai batai no let me complete the thing is that one when you started before your presentation there was lot of talk in in assamese or bengalis was going on there were words with meanings but i was not able to understand anything for me they were only the dhoni so from where this dhoni gets the meaning the, the language how the language perform this function I, I think okay. they, these are some of the curiosities. This is these are not the questions for. Right, right. Everybody. Thank you for Thank you. Uh, bringing them on the platform. Uh, the first, the very first question that what is my take? I would go with Puth Mimansa because I uh, believe uh, that words have a special special significance. we human beings are language users i understand that there are many things that we learn through convention we learn through you know um, our elders but when it comes to uh, the relationship between word and meaning i think mimansa school uh, is uh, very sound in you know explaining the relationship between word and meaning as natural because it is i don't see that this bond can be created it is a it cannot be a creation of human it it is beyond human capacity to create you know uh, language and when i say language i am referring to sanskrit i am referring to sanskrit panini grammar i am referring to a discourse which is completely very very technical and also i wish to bring it on record that when we read bhartri hari it is not only about mimansa mimansa and bhartri uh, grammarians they are almost you know they are on the same platform uh, when it comes to acceptance of eternality of words when it comes to natural relationship between word and meaning so they are uh, they go well together so i also uh, would prefer you know uh, bhartri haris or grammarian standpoint uh, when you know they uh, their entire discourse on sport which is a unified uh, you know uh, totality of reality they rather consider shabd as tatva as reality and i also um, agree with uh, purvni mansa when uh, they say that word promotes word motivates it entices us into action this is very significant a word entices us into action wo lagata hai hame kaam mein lagata hai prohibit karta hai kaam mein lagata hai motivate karta hai protect karta hai so word is somewhere and also you know entire this uh, mantra tradition also uh, you know it is said that ek ha shabd samyak prayukta once even once in lifetime if you have used the word correctly it really saves you it really serves you it not only saves you from you know different atrocities but it also serves you like anything so i would first to, to your first question i would go with purvni mansa and i uh, mentioned it uh, when i began my presentation and to the second question that word without a meaning uh, i would say that it is uh, possibly Mm, not the case it can be an objectless thing a word cannot it it is possible that the word may not have a uh, you know referent out there but it may have a meaning referent out there means if you ask me to show you a unicorn if you ask me to show you, you a golden mountain the word is there the meaning is there but the object is lacking right so there can be things there can be words which have meaning but which may not have objects right if suppose concept of god the word has meaning it has a word it has a meaning but it it does not has it it does not refer to anything objective right that's your second question 
coming to the third question that you said, ether as a reality. Uh, if you are talking of ether as the fifth element that we talk of, Pancha Mahabhutas, that is Prithvi, Jal, Tej, Vayu, Akash, I do not see any reason to deny the existence of ether, Alokji. I'm uh, I'm a little surprised that how the you know element of Akash or element of ether. I mean, just because it. I mean, what are the grounds? I'm not aware, but we can off the off this platform. We can discuss it later. That what are the grounds on which Akash? You know, uh, it is only the Charvakas who have denied Akash. Yes. Otherwise, all the schools have accepted existence of Akash. Rather, Akash is the, if you see the evolution, uh, you know, uh, the, what do we say that uh, Panchikaran, the process of Panchikaran begins with Akash, right? So Akash is the foremost fundamental uh, element and I don't see any reason uh, for its denial. And uh, the last question that, the last query rather, uh, what was it, dhvani and sound? How language acquires... Uh, okay, uh, you were talking in the context of uh, Assamese. Uh, you are absolutely right that there are languages which make no sense to us sometimes. If I visit Germany and, you know, there are people talking in German language, I will not make sense. It similarly happens with, you know, Bach's symphonies in music also. There are a lot many arts and uh, art, um, artistic activities thereby, you know, we have to learn. I have to learn the symbol of uh, symbols and signs that are being used in Bharatnatyam. I do not know them. So learning is always there. Learning, you can learn it. It is not that uh, there is an impossibility of learning. You wish to learn Assamese, you can easily learn, right? So there is a possibility of learning. That is, uh, that is how I would like to respond. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. So, Rip Jyoti has raised his hand. Rip Jyoti, would you like to ask anything? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, firstly, a very good evening to one and all present here and respected uh, Shivani Sharma, ma'am. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you for your illuminating uh, lecture. And I'm Rip Jyoti Sharma from uh, Department of Philosophy, Pandu College. Ma'am, uh, in fifth sem, we have learned about uh, Wittgenstein's concept of meaning and language. Uh, so I would like to ask you that, is there any uh, resemblance or can we see any resemblance between the Indian concept of meaning and uh, Wittgenstein's concept of meaning, ma'am? Uh, in the beginning, I, is, that, is that all the question? Of yes. course. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah, ma yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, in the beginning, very beginning of my presentation, I mentioned that, yes, uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, I quoted rather uh, TRV Murthy, that what we can know is deeply connected to what I can say. I can know only what I can say. And that is how language comes in, right? So language has a very great role in understanding what you know, what is given to you in your experience. So certainly, yes, uh, it it has similar tones, but when you move on to uh, grammarians, then probably uh, Wittgenstein, not with regard to meaning, but the entire discourse and the paradigm uh, will be changed. So certainly uh, with regard to the concept of meaning, uh, yes, uh, the Vyavaharic, uh, aspect the pragmatics of language and uh, you know meaning the word and meaning relationship it will continue of course uh, thank you ma'am thank you so much thank you thank you thank you i can see pratibha sharma ma'am has raised her hand ma'am would you like to ask anything thank you for the permission and uh, thank you dr shivani sharma for your enlightening lecture it was means i it I felt as if I am in the class of a teacher and listening to the lecture. So it was <laughs> very informative, but I have a few points where I want to raise questions. First is when old Nayaikas, I think you were mentioning about old Nayaikas when you said that the bond between word and uh, knowledge is uh, in the form of the will of God. Mm. So I 
to this modern ayikas only with my little knowledge about uh, indian theory of language modern ayikas uh, deny this and they say that uh, when a father uh, gives name to his uh, child after 10 days then it is not in the form of the will of god hmm. and if coining new word is always the will of god then what about new uh, uh, insertions in the language new introductions new words uh, Uh, how are new words introduced in any language if uh, according to old nayikas it is always the will of god that mm -hmm. is the cause of the bond mm -hmm. so this is my first question in fact it is a question and secondly you used the word abhida somewhere mm -hmm. uh, in some context uh, i forgot what was the context because i am not a master in this but to my little knowledge uh, i think there are three types of meanings mentioned by nayikas and other indian schools of philosophy one is shakti arth rakshan arth and third is abhida which is the denotation denotative meaning of fage or asal when we denote to indicate towards something so mm -hmm. is it that abhida which you were talking or is there some other interpretation of the word abhida also that you were talking these two are main things baki to uh, professor tandan said a lot about locution means locution is the sound when elocution you also talked about mm -hmm. elocution what we do while speaking we question we answer we doubt we wonder and also when he was saying about uh, the word without a meaning i think he was uh, referring to the to fages distinction between sense and reference some words do have sense but they do not have reference yes. i think words Three. like unicorn and uh, other uh, god and soul also are words like that only so but i have only two questions in my mind please yeah. right. right thank you thank you so much uh, first i'll address the last question abhidha and shakyarth yes uh, abhidha refers to uh, the literal meaning it uh, it refers to uh, the denotative meaning but uh, uh, why i used i used that the old nayikas use this word abhida for the will of god they say that it is the will of the god uh, out of which you know this uh, there is a bond between the bond between uh, word and meaning which was created by god is known to be abhida but abhida here in other context when you are referring to denotative meaning or denotative uh, word it refers to abhidha lakshana and vyanjana that we have three forms of uh, words whereby abhidha refers to uh, literal meaning the denotative meaning and uh, what was uh, your first question old nayikas will of god and the navya nayikas they rejected uh, that is uh, absolutely correct Uh, I'm forgetting the question, Pratibha. Can you just? Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. about when we introduce new words to a language. How ah. does it become the will of God to okay. give a to establish a bond between the word and the meaning? No, probably this is the reason that Navya Nayakas uh, accept uh, you know convention as the methodology that language is learned through convention by because new words can be always added. New words can be added only if you accept. that yes language can be learned conventionally otherwise if you believe in the system of you know uh, although there is a possibility from the grammarian uh, standpoint that new words can emerge and if if you follow see the entire discourse that we get for um, philosophy of language comes from uh, you know um, grammarian standpoint the roots the etymology uh, like you know the uh, first maheshwar sutras you know ai un ri ri e ong ai au chhaya varat you know all these sutras they the permutation and combinations give us enough of scope and chance to formulate new words but the entire paradigm refers only to sanskrit and the sanskrit grammar so these are upper branches these languages that we talk in these are upper branches and certainly the kind of language new words that we get to see and you know they are getting into uh, oxford di dictionary also for example the word jugad has come into uh, now dictionaries and many more yeah, right a small you know the words thank you 
our own students they write ty and we get you know you know bamble boost ki ye kya likha hai ty ka kya matlab hai apne hamare apne bacche not only students so we we get to use but these are sign languages they are they have a meaning and meaning is conventionally constructed that i have learned it from my student okay ma'am isko aise aise kahenge so i get to learn but this is conventional right thank you thank you dr shyam uh main mera question tha chota sa uh hello ha 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 bolo garo ha main mera question tha question ye tha jise language ka jo ek feature hai wo hai कम्युनिकेशन जैसे कि आप बात कर रहे हैं जी और जो जो नोस पर कह रहा है कि देखो टैगिंग जो वर्ड है वो इतनी टैगिंग होती है चीजों के बारे में आ, तो मेरा क्वेश्चन था कि जैसे हम जनरली कहते हैं वी कैन नोट थिंक विदाउट लैंग्वेज तो जो हमारी थिंकिंग का जो प्रोसीजर है वो भी भाषा के अंदर ही होता है तो माई क्वेश्चन अब यहाँ पे यह है कि जैसे कि हम मोगली के बारे में शोध हमने पढ़ी है बचपन में कि मोगली जंगल में पैदा हुआ उसके पास हमारी जिस तरह की जो हम एक एडवांस भाषा यूज कर रहे हैं वो उसके पास नहीं है तो वो किस तरह की भाषा में अपना थिंकिंग प्रोसेस वो कर रहा है तो उस चीज को हम कैसे मतलब किस तरह से समझ सकते हैं क्या विदाउट लैंग्वेज थिंकिंग प्रोसेस चल सकता है क्वेश्चन नंबर एक मेरा यह क्वेश्चन दूसरा ये है कि जो जैसे हम अंडरस्टैंडिंग कहते हैं समझ हाँ हाँ बोलो क्या रिलेशनशिप है क्या जो अंडरस्टैंडिंग है समझ है वो विदाउट लैंग्वेज भी एग्जिस्ट करती है to your first question uh whether without language we can think uh i think uh, thinking is a reflective process thinking is a rational process whereby you know uh, we scrutinize uh, ideas we uh, we play with our words we play with our thoughts we play with our uh, uh, reflective abilities so thinking without language is not a possibility right and that is why the aim of indian philosophical tradition is to transcend this language game entirely so that there is complete poise and composure in you know that is why they want to transcend this linguistic paradigm so uh, thinking and language they go side by side they have to be one they they are a united process and secondly understanding the relationship between understanding and language now here i will fall back upon gadamer for your understanding that understanding also happens in language and the feature of understanding is that you will interpret only that what you have understood you cannot deviate from uh, you can you cannot interpret something absolutely new which is which you have not understood so gadamer would say that you will interpret only what you have understood and you will understand in a language that will be a very particular case so in the case of mogli that you were referring mogli i am sure that you know that mogli died very soon when he was brought into a social system he could not survive uh, for a longer time right now probably uh, i'm not sure what were the causes what was the reason uh, for his such an early death when he was brought into a normal system for humans uh but yes he he was he grew up with uh conditions thereby you know um wolves thereby animals uh they were you know uh, just a second my my battery is going wait 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 okay what was i saying ha huh. so uh, he grew up with uh, conditions which were uh, not very normal imagine that he was into uh, circumstances which were uh, uh, you know which was so awkward that he he must be on some eating patterns which were 
you know meant for animals so for him raw meat and cooked cooked food uh, you know probably cooked food was not in his you know purview or, or purview of imagination so he was probably rather i would say that this shows that the capacity of man to be an animal is rather you know uh, you can justify it that man can be actually he can live like an animal and bringing him back to his humanity uh, costed him his life uh, but this is a, a good point this is uh, this point needs to be deliberated more deeply that why uh, but this is for sure gorov that uh, when it comes to learning a language one can learn language so new language can be always learned thank you uh ma'am uh, process is uh... Uh, uh there are other questions gorov तो जो मेरा अनुभव है हम उसको भी एज ए समझ ले सकते हैं तो उसको हम भाषा के साथ किस तरह से करके समझे तो थोड़ा सा मैं इस उस सेंस में पूछ रहा था कि समझ में और भाषा के बीच में कहीं ना कहीं भाषा क्या है एक ऑब्जेक्टिव कंसेप्चुलाइज करना हाँ। लेकिन हम सभी तरह की समझ को कंसेप्चुलाइज कर शायद नहीं कर पाते तो उसके साथ भाषा का किस तरह रिलेशनशिप होगा थिंक ऑफ हाँ थिंक केस ऑफ अ चाइल्ड वेर हैज नॉट लर्न लैंग्वेज एज येट बट ही हैज एन अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ द फिनोमिना दैट इज हैिंग विद हिम राइट सो अंडरस्टैंडिंग इज देयर लैंग्वेज इज नॉट देयर बट ग्रेजुअली ही विल ट्राई टू लर्न and reach to <clears throat> linguistic use the final culmination of understanding is into the language why because you we are a human being we we are not only a human being but we and being human we have one fundamental feature that is communication inter intersubjective communication that is the fundamental uh, feature of language i don't restrict i i rather find ways and means to express myself as beautifully as i can through language that is why i read poetry i i write poetry i i try to be you know uh, as beautiful as i can be in my expressions so that is one of the features that understanding will finally culminate into language into expressions <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> okay thank you ram uh, thank you now utkarsh mishra good evening ma'am firstly thank you for such an enriching talk my question was a general one we are philosophy first year students and when we tell somebody that we are studying philosophy they say that their reply is not okay or uh, nice but they say that why philosophy so it is not considered a mainstream social sciences subject so and why is this perspective and how can we change that and what is your take ma'am thank you all right this is <clears throat> one of the very interesting questions that we often face as teachers of philosophy that <clears throat> there are people that why philosophy so uh, there are many answers to this but to be very uh, crisp and brief that philosophy is said to be mother of all sciences and why is it so because it deals conceptually it deals with abstractions just as maths you know maths is a very analytical kind of it is an objective language you know you ascribe meaning but <clears throat> so far philosophy is concerned we are not we are asked to shun our presuppositions we are asked to uh, you know have your uh, own meanings of ideas you you can have you are you are considered to be a free bird whereby you can uh, you know have an adventure with ideas you can play with your ideas you can uh, you know you 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 can be more free and uh, to be little more casual in my response i would say that you should rather ask people those who ask why philosophy then ask them why grandparents why do you have grandparents at home <laughs> because when it comes to crisis you go to them and ask them for their opinions you ask them for their experience you ask them for their knowledge and that is the purpose of philosophy that it gives you knowledge it it helps you to realize things which other social sciences are not going to do it for you and that is why the significance of philosophy comes in that is why 
students of philosophy will always have an edge over other students those who you know uh, are more pragmatic in their approaches in their disciplines uh, why because student of philosophy has no other tool other than thinking rational tools of you know getting into the skin of concepts getting into the skin of ideas and that is why i think um, that this is this is the only victory that we have that we can think logically we can think uh, at, we can think in abstractions most of the many of the philosophers if you see they were mathematicians they were coming from physics why because they were talking in ideas all physicists all mathematicians they were uh, you know none but you know uh, philosophers in their thinking they were dealing with ideas and it is all about ideas once you have knowledge it will transform you it will that knowledge has to be realized and thereby you you feel transformed i think that should answer thank you ma'am and i think that i have a perfect answer for my query yeah. now yes yes thank you next paramita paramita has raised yes. hand yeah. namaskar ma'am your lecture is very much enlightening and as you said ma'am in your lecture that there are two aspects of sound perishable and imperishable i would like to know just there's these two aspects what are these two referring could you please show some light on it ma'am uh you are referring to uh, bhartri hari's point of view that um, there is uh, one aspect which is perishable the word has two aspects one is perishable what is perishable that it comes with a sound the word comes to us suppose what i'm speaking to you now is it is coming to you through sound the word is uh, identical with the sound right but it is perishable after a while in few seconds it will go away it will vanish away and that is how it is perishable but the idea that has got into your mind through this conversation okay. or whatsoever it is sport that will sustain itself but this is not the actual interpretation the imperishable is the shabda tatva which will never change which is uh, which is which is a transcendental shabd which is the why because they consider shabd to be brahman for grammarians shabd the imperishable aspect of shabd is actually a tatva a reality which will never perish away but this the word that is you know happening between you and me it is perishable certainly it is perishable okay ma'am thank you thank you thank you next namita nimbalkar ma'am uh thank you organizers for such a wonderful uh webinar and it was great to hear from you dr shivani uh i have a simple question and uh, it's uh, based on a few of the works that were carried out i want to know that does language brackets people of different backgrounds and at the same time because of this bracketing we do come across the economic and cultural circumstances and we also can talk about the social inequality which takes place so what are how do we bridge this gap what can be done to bridge the gap like when we talk of bringing philosophy into the practical realm so how do we try to bridge the gap and thank you thank you nikols hmm uh see uh, i think this bridging gap uh, belongs to a different paradigm because bringing uh, people you know together bringing them close this is a matter of compassion this is a matter of human humanity and um, technically um, i would say that yes of course um, language does bracket us people those who know english people those who know assamese people those who know punjabi people those who know french uh, it does bracket us but uh, at certain point of uh uh life it becomes very very insignificant and that is how you know uh, we as students of philosophy and especially for uh, students of ethics uh, the role starts here that 
uh, we are time and again being asked by the tradition to be more kind, compassionate, you know, Maitri, Karuna, Mudita, Upeksha. Uh, these are the values that are being uh, taught to us. Not only us, I mean, it, these are the universal values. But uh, you're right that uh, language has this capacity to, uh, you know, bracket or classify people. But this is not the capacity of language. I would say this is the uh, mindset of people, those who want it to be bracket bracketed. Uh, so it is not the language which will practically divide us. It will not, uh, for example, it is known that Germans, uh, they, they are very, you know, um, I won't say arrogant. This doesn't uh, go well with the spirit. But there are, uh, you know, even for Sanskrit, I, I can say that people, those who know Sanskrit, they can uh, claim that, yes, uh, we know Sanskrit. But this is just a mindset. This is not a problem of language. Um, I mean, the, you know, the propounder of, uh, uh, you know, linguistic philosophy, uh, they have never claimed that we are superior or uh, they are superior or who is superior. That has never been the question. The question is that language, through language, you know, uh, you can reach the higher uh, reality. And that is how Purva Mimansa also, you know, when they propound the concept of Devata, they say Devata is not somewhere, you know, it is not an entity which exists. It is just the word. You say Indra, Indra is right there. You just have to say it with all uh, purity. You just have to feel the, you know, the entity of that Devata. So it is just a word. And uh, if uh, we believe in this, so my word uh, that when I say that, yes, I I respect this person, I respect this woman, then I actually mean it. So the difference between word and meaning, uh, you know, demarcates us and the unity between word and meaning connects us. That is all, I think. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you for asking a wonderful question. Thank you. Anybody? Jutika? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you, ma'am, for your delightful lecture. Uh, I have a little query about your lecture. That even in your lecture, you have mentioned that according to Purva Mimangsha, uh, reality can be known or expressed through language. Uh, and uh, uh, is it referring to the ultimate reality or if it is ultimate then how can it be expressed through language ma'am can yeah. you explain this in yeah, yeah, yeah. lines sure 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 Purmi okay. Mansa has been my weakness yeah. and oh, okay. I'm fond of this philosophy mm -hmm. to some extent mm -hmm. uh, see uh, reality for Purmi Mansa scholars is two pronged it is drisht and adrisht adrisht does not essentially mean God and they are not talking of Brahma at all. It is rightly opposed to Vedanta. So they are not talking of God. They are saying that under Adrisht category, only three things fall. Only three entities fall. One is Apurv, that is action. The result, oh, sorry, not action. The result of action, right? Apurv. And second is Swarga. And Swarga is not something which exists somewhere else. It is right here between beautiful women, having the company of beautiful women, having good uh, clothes to wear, having good food to eat. This is how they define. No, no, I'm serious, right? And thirdly, Apurva, uh, Swarga, and uh, I again uh, fall the third one. Uh, always forget this. Devata. Devata, yeah. And uh, finally is the Devata. So they are adrisht for them. They are not talking of, they are not saying that uh, Brahman is the ultimate reality. No, it is for Vedanta who will claim so. So that is how uh, for them, language is perfect tool to understand reality. Reality is not something beyond language for them. And that is how Wittgenstein, who asked uh, recently, Rishi, I think, you know, he, Wittgenstein would also say, yes, oh, you cannot speak, be silent. Why? Because your language is perfect tool to understand reality. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think ma'am may be tired, so we should <laughs> we would like to go on, but we have to stop here, I think. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, anybody else? 
on Anu Kaushik, uh, we'll take this question as our last question. Anu Kaushik. Good evening, ma'am. Good, Good evening, evening, everyone present there. Ma'am, my question is that in the Mimamsa Darshan, there is a place to be a prominent place in the reality. So, they talk about a word in the Lok Vahivar and a word in the Ved Vahivar. And in the Ved Vahivar, they talk about the word in the Ved Vahivar, that they should pronounce it in the mantra. If you don't pronounce it in the mantra, it will become a distorted meaning. So, for this reason, the layman is so, he can't reach the reality of the reality. According to the Imam, if he doesn't have a Sanskrit or he won't be pronounced in the word, then this is my question. This question is very interesting. But you have seen a little reality as Jutika Ji was watching. Reality is not something that you have to reach anywhere. Reality is right here for the Imam. They are not saying that Ved will lead you to uh, some other world. They are saying Ved will lead you nowhere but to action. The Vedic statement will finally motivate you to indulge in into action. And now that action will result something for you. It will it, have some result for you. And once it has some result for you, either it will be, you know, uh, exhausted and then you will have to come back. The Karma principle is the ultimate principle for Mimansakas. And that is how, you know, for them, uh, getting motivated for, uh, or getting into action is the ultimate uh, purpose of Veda. And that okay. is how they say that uh, Veda is nothing but injunction. It it has injunctive sentences. Ki aap aisa kare. Aap vaisa kare. Agar aisa chahte hai, to aisa kare. Aisa karna chahte hai, to aisa kare. These are only injunctive sentences uh, found to be, uh, which are found to be in Vedas. But okay, uh, yeah, but so far your first part of the question was very significant. That the pronunciation, yes, pronunciation. Agar aapka ucharan sahi nahi hai, to mantra ka kete arth ka anarth hota hai. This is true, very true, and that is why they in one of my uh, you know conditions. Uh, to interpret meaning of the word, the last one was swara, swar lagana. Aapka swar kahan par, kis tarha pe zor jo aapko mene example diya tha, indra, indra ke baare mein. Ki agar aap pehle hisse pe zor dal denge, to wo banega kuch aur last syllable par agar aap force dalenge, ucharan dalenge, to uska arth kuch aur ho jayega. To isi liye ucharan ki shuddhata, is one of the fundamental uh, concerns of Mimansa philosophy. We can't deny it. That is true. Absolutely correct. Anu. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, thank you, ma'am. Your thank speech you. is extremely interesting and beneficial also. And thank you, audience, for your cooperation. The session is very vibrant, actually. So now I request uh, Deboshri Kosik, my colleague, to give vote of thanks. Good evening to all of you present here. As we come to the end of this lecture session, so I am going to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of the Department of Philosophy, Pandu College. In the beginning, I, on behalf of Pandu College family, Sincerely thank to our respected Sivkis, Dr. Sivani Sorma Mem, Department of Philosophy, Punjab University, for enlightening us with her delightful lecture on critical thinking and philosophizing. We are extremely thankful to ICPR for their sponsorship in this lecture series. We would like to extend our gratitude to our respected principal, Dr. Jugesh Kakuti for his enormous support in organizing this program. We offer our gratitude to our respected Vice Principal, Dr. Sarbari Roy and Dr. Sirin Banu, 
who have graced the occasion with your presence. We extend a really hearty vote of thanks to our respected Vice Principal, Dr. Sirin Banu, for her inaugural speech. We are extremely thankful to the resource persons of our two previous lectures, Professor A. Raghuramaraju and Professor Nabokumar Hendi, for their wonderful lecture sessions. Our very special thanks goes to all respected dignitaries, faculty members, and research scholars from various departments of different colleges and universities for their cooperation. We express our heartfelt thanks to Ripsuti Sorma, Prabahan Saiko, and Dipsuti Das for their beautiful bandana, bandis, and bhajan in the beginning of each session. Our end of the lecture series has been successful one by the participation of our dear students. We appreciate their sincere cooperation in this lecture series. This vote of thanks would be largely incomplete without expressing our gratitude to Dr. Sansai Juti Bora and Dr. Gauri Sankar Karmakar, who have been working really hard for arranging this wonderful lecture series. I would like to mention the names of our respected faculty members, HOD Dr. Moitri Sorma and Dr. Moyuri Barman, who have wholeheartedly involved in this program. Thank you. Thank you, Devastri. I also thank my colleague Devastri Koshik for her sincere effort to make this uh, program successful. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, ma'am. It was wonderful to be with you all. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Sharbari, ma'am. Thank, thank you, Jutika. Thank you, Devastri. Thank you, Mayuri. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye.